Hello again, and welcome to our Star Trek Next Generation review. This week, uh, we have Alan, Namir, and we're joined by Lola. Code of Honor, written by Catherine Powers and Michael Barron. Directed by Russ Mayberry, but really Les Landau. In a mind-blowingly culturally insensitive adventure, the Enterprise, in need of a special vaccine that can't possibly be recreated by replicators, apparently, make contact with the pre-warp civilization, the Ligonians. Conveniently for the plot, and even though they've already violated the Prime Directive, they choose not to violate the Prime Directive further by just taking what they need, as that would end the episode before the first commercial break. Their leader, Lutan, comes aboard and instantly has the hots for Tasha Yar and decides, after a brief visit and with no consideration, to risk his people's very existence by kidnapping Yar and ignoring the Enterprise's powerful and uncharacteristically threatening show of force. In a further display of short-sightedness, Lutan decides to also dump his wife, Yarina, and plans to marry Yar and withhold the vaccine if Picard does not cooperate with his wishes. Yarina demands a fight to the death to see who deserves to win this jerk's love, and after a clumsily choreographed fight with some poison pin cushion mittens, Yar lands a fatal blow and beams away with Yarina's corpse. Lutan gives Picard the vaccine now that he has inherited all his dead wife's valuable property and seems happy to be rid of the old ball and chain. However, Dr. Crusher revives Yarina with the most quickly developed anti-venom ever. Yarina then gives Lutan a quickie divorce for being such a devious dick and offers Yar her seconds, but despite thinking he was sexy early on, Yar says it would be complicated and wisely refuses the offer. Hmm. I don't know what to say about the episode. It's obviously dated, right? There's there's a there's there's a lot there that needs to kind of be unpacked. When I first started watching the episode, it, it felt very like 1960s to me. It felt like, okay, this is something that they would have done in the original Star Trek. And then the more I watched it and the more I thought about it, I was like, I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable. You know, like there's this there's this weird kind of like feeling in my stomach, and I don't know what it is. Oh, wait a second. It's overt racism. <laughs> That's what it's called. Then you shall have no treaty, no vaccine, and no Lieutenant Yar. Well, you know, I feel like this episode is a triple threat because not only is it racist, it's also extremely sexist and condescending. The weapons in that room, Captain, are surprisingly flexible, durable, and deadly. And light, as if they were made for women to use. Mm. Um, I wish they spent more on the barely a B plot of uh, Wesley wanting to push buttons on the bridge computers because <laughs> that would have been much better time spent than than Planet Side with these uh yeah with these stereotypes. <laughs> I remember a haze of of wrong throughout the entire episode, so everything kind of gets blurred into one. A woman, your chief of security. Yes, Lutam, that is her expertise. All the the stereotypical portrayal aside, like the mirror said, if you put any other, you know, I guess they're originally supposed to be lizard people too. Apparently, according to if you read the background information before they made it a African themed planet, the script felt like an original series episode, uh, a bad third season one, but <laughs> definitely there was definitely a '60s vibe uh, to it, and I guess that's probably partially because you know a lot of the early fifth, first season writing staff were pulled from the original writing staff of the 60s. It's 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 a hard one to get through. First time I watched the episode, I guess when it first came out, I, I didn't watch it and go, hmm, there's some overt racism happening here. Yeah, it's a, it's a planet based on African culture, right? Like I wasn't really thinking about it too deeply. It's like a result of the time that it came out, right? Like it wasn't like part of a, 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 a national conversation. We didn't really have it top of mind. We weren't really thinking about it too much, right? But now that we are, some of those issues are really, really apparent. The issue of political correctness was just becoming part of the um, mainstream conversation, like in the late 80s, early 90s. I remember seeing it at that time and thinking the episode was odd. Is this racist? Because it was part of the kind of stuff that my parents were talking about. 
like when we went to see Three Amigos, they were like, "That's a cultural appropriation and of Mexican stereotypes." Did Did you watch Three Amigos with your with your parents and they criticized it and you're like, "What are you talking about? This movie is hilarious." <laughs> I love Three Amigos. Okay, just just on that point, if the episode was better, like if it was like a really amazing episode, mm-hmm. would we have been okay with the the kind of questionable stereotypes? I don't think it's about like being okay with it because you can be like, oh, I like that episode. I like the plot or, you know, whatever it is that you liked about it, but still acknowledge the the racist or sexist elements of it, right? It's like it's like watching like an old episode of Three's Company where you're like, this is really funny, but, you know, there, there's some stuff here that's not that great. The sin of this episode is that it's a bad episode. And then on top of being a bad episode, it's also a racist and sexist episode. So... <laughs> There's basically very little redeeming features. We're not technologically advanced as you, yet we possess something you do not. A vaccine, if you respect our customs, and we see that respect, we will be friends. It's funny because you say it's it's a product of the time, but I say the same the same writer later in this would be like 1997 say wrote the fourth episode of the first season of stargate sg1 and that therefore they they encountered a race of asian people on the planet and there was a bunch of misogyny in that too with how they treated women because they they again they abduct the female member of the group like it's a, almost the exact same <laughs> same scenario as written by the exact same person I don't think they learned anything from their, their missteps from 10 years prior. But I remember reading that it was the director that made the change from lizard people to, um, you know, Af- an African culture. When Gene Roddenberry found out about it, he was like, oh, this isn't cool. And then he fired the director and that director never worked on a Star Trek thing again. So maybe it was the yeah. same director on Stargate. When that director was uh, fired, he was replaced by the assistant director, Les Landau. And then Les Landau ended up becoming uh, a regular director on not just The Next Generation, but Deep Space Nine and I think Voyager as well. Do, do you think Les was like, hey, yeah, you should do this. This is, this is, gonna, this is a great idea. No, no, no. There's not going to be any sort of blowback. It'll be fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming they just went with it because of time constraints for you know, the quick turnaround. They probably didn't have the lizard masks made up or anything. So they're like, well, I guess we're just going to have to go with it. They, they saved it for, uh, they saved all the lizard costumes for Lonely Among Us. Because that was a good use of lizard costumes. How different do you think it would be if they did end up making it like a lizard planet? I think it would have been better. I personally, I think it would have been better if it was a, a lizard race. Although, you know what w- would have been really interesting if they kept all of that stuff with Tasha Yar being attracted to, um, what's his name, Lutan, but Lutan was a lizard, right? Like that would have been kind of cool because it's like the future, right? Like it's it's like you know people don't see race, but they also don't see morphology. You know, <laughs> <laughs> anybody can fall in love with anybody else. That's pretty progressive. A sample of the vaccine. My duty, Lutan. I'm sorry, but I'm required to inspect Out of my way, woman. How interesting. They made a really big deal of uh, Tashiar being like Picard's bodyguard. Like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You're you're bringing this thing over to the captain? I got to look at this. No, no, stay. Get out of my way, woman. And then she she like karate flips him and, and checks it and all this stuff. And that never, ever, ever happens again. People are touching and and staying really close to Picard all throughout the series, and this is the only time that she she acts or anybody acts as like a bodyguard kind of. Yeah, I thought that was strange too. My my favorite part of that whole of that whole scene is obviously they did it because they needed to have her and the the second the character of the second, you know, have that that confrontation. But then she just kind of opens it and is like, oh yeah, it looks okay. And then close it. <laughs> like she doesn't scan it. She doesn't do anything with it. She doesn't like lift the tubes up to see if there's something underneath. She's just like, yeah, it's fine. Here you go. I don't know what this is. Here. <laughs> totally okay. May I also extend a personal farewell to Lieutenant Yar in your Federation terms? 
The Carter Bridge, red alert. I always found it weird in this in this episode, Picard's reaction when Tashiar is abducted because it's supposed to be a big surprise. He just grabs her and then beams away, and then Picard just like calmly turns around and says. Picard to bridge, red alert or whatever. And I don't know if that's a special effect because of the cross fade, you know, of, of, of the transporter <laughs> and he had to stand still or something, but there's like no reaction, <laughs> no like attempt to grab her or like, oh, you know, what's going on? It, it's just very calm. Like, I just imagine him like, like turning to the rest of his crew and going, well, that was some bullshit. <laughs> and, then, like, and then calling me up. <laughs> Opinion counselor, will they injure Lieutenant Yar? I believe not, sir. They seem mainly curious. In kind of like film history in general, there's a lot of this kind of stereotype of like either an African or an indigenous culture or person like stealing a white woman. Like it starts with Birth of a Nation. Um, The original King Kong is the same thing where like they go to this island filled with indigenous people who are played by um, like Africans or African-Americans and then they steal a white woman for King Kong. Well, and it's, it's interesting because there's a real kind of colonial element to the episode that's kind of inadvertent because they are like Africa in space and then these white people come in a, in a spaceship and they kind of like trick them into kind of plundering their natural resource. Like there's that whole element playing out throughout, throughout it, but it's without any kind of irony or self-awareness or anything. And I'm like, this is so interesting. I, well, I was going to ask, like, what did they get in return? I don't remember. Like, what was the deal? They got honor and respect. Did they, did they not get anything in return? Yeah, the there was some talk about a treaty. And and I think they were just, again, doing it out of the, out of the goodness of, 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 you know, of their hearts at first. And then, you know, that turned into, well, I want your women or... <laughs> the vaccine... I'm a physician, I've seen death, but not on the scale this could mean. You must get the vaccine from the planet, Captain, as much as you can, immediately. Why couldn't Crusher replicate the vaccine? Oh yeah, well, she says in in a meeting with Picard that there's like some reason that they can't replicate it. And I'm like, it just seems very contrived. Like, oh, this Uh, one just happens to be the hardest thing to replicate in the the galaxy. I'd like to mention the, the awkward segue that Dr. Crusher has. For uh, in the in the in the meeting where she's like talking about the urgency of this epidemic and and needing to get the vaccine, and then she coughs. I'd like to talk to you about Wesley. <laughs> like, it's really the best time to bring bring up the fact that your your boy is interested in coming to play with some of the bridge controls and learn. It's like it's like Wesley said. It's like, Mom, can you ask Captain Picard if I can come on the bridge? <laughs> it's like, well, we're really kind of busy right now, but I'll see what I can do. And Picard humors oh, yeah, her, actually- goes out and invites Wesley, come out and come and stand <laughs> at Ops. Come sit at Ops and push him on the like, really <laughs> just, just sit in the control and, and just forget the fact that I killed your father. Just push the buttons. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Wait, did he actually kill his dad? Well, he was his commanding officer, so he, I think he ordered him to... Yeah. They, they're never clear on it ever in the in the show. He's, he's, he's part, somewhat partly responsible. I knew your father, Wesley. Want to look around? But, you know, I think that's actually kind of like the, the subtext of the whole thing is that he he feels responsible for Wesley's dad dying. And so he is trying to kind of, you know, be flexible with, with Wesley and kind of be a little bit more... Um, Dad like to him, but was yeah. that the best time for it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't pick and choose when you're going to be a father, Alan. <laughs> it, yes, I agree. You should, you know, we could let him on the bridge to learn something, but maybe at a later time when we're not all facing, you know, a possible armed conflict. I mean, how do you feel about Wesley? Do you think, like, what does he add to? To the show, I don't know. In retrospect, it's something just to make fun of because he's so poorly portrayed, you know, for for, for being a fifteen-year-old boy. I think he was there to be the surrogate for all the kids watching the show. Oh, if I was on the Enterprise, that's I would be Wesley. It's like complete fantasy wish fulfillment. If I was on Star Trek, then I would want to be a Mozart-like 
level genius. As a teenage boy, I did not, you know, I did not aspire to be Wesley. N- nobody did. <laughs> we were inspired to be, aspired to be the opposite of Wesley. Yeah, like, I want to be Riker. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, okay. So here's here's my theory. It's kind of like like yours, Lucas, a little bit. Like there there needed to be a character. Like normally, there's always like a new character, and that new character's job is to basically be the soundboard for the audience. So they ask the questions that the audience is thinking, right? Like, oh, like, what does this thing do? To me, that's kind of what Wesley was supposed to be doing, but he already knew everything. Like he, he, he already knew everything about the ship. So he, he wasn't actually fulfilling his character's purpose. Jake Sisko later on in Deep Space Nine had a much more realistic portrayal of a teenage boy, you know, getting into trouble and interesting girls. Is this the food replicator? Wesley's interesting about being like the question asker for the audience, because I feel like Data does that better. At least when I'm watching, whenever there's something new, Data's always the one who's like, this means that and for this reason. And I'm like, okay, that's the, you know, the sci-fi stuff that I need to know for this episode. It reads similar to early Starfleet efforts, but uses the Heglanian shift to convert energy and matter in different... Which is actually not important at this time. And now, according to the customs of your ancestors, whom we honor and respect, I am here in peace to ask for the return of Lieutenant Yar. I thought, oh, you know, actually there's a redeemable element here, which is Picard and his character and how he's dealing with the culture with respect and honor. And and then halfway through the episode, the integrity of the character totally goes off the rails, lying, pretending that he's like all chummy with the alien race. It's almost a bit more like Kirk. I feel like Kirk would be more likely to lie or... Oh, yeah. When you think about how he, you know, when Kirk played that made up card game to trick the those gangs that gangster planet so was he was he violating the prime directive by kind of doing that well that's was that was my whole issue with this this episode was was like is this not a violation of the prime directive that they're even dealing with these people they seem to have no space varying capability <laughs> by our standards the customs here their code of honor is the same kind of pompous strutting charades that endangered our own species a few centuries ago we evolved out of it because no one tried to impose their own set of... I'm sorry, this is becoming a speech. <laughs> okay, so see, that would have been a perfect spot for him to be explaining it to Wesley, right? Because Wesley, he's like, Captain Picard, what's the prime directive? And, you know, he'd be like, let me tell you, you know? That that would have been great. He already knows it, though. That fight that she had with Lutan's wife was extremely slow. And for some reason, she had a headband on, but her she has short hair, right? So there's there's no reason for hair to get in her eyes. It, it was just there to make her look like she's like, okay, I'm preparing for battle, like Rambo, right? She's like, okay, Ready I'm in a battle you. now, so I'm going to put a headband on. <laughs> I love that matte painting of yes. the top of the hill. And, and then with the laser beams, that's really cool. And I really like the music, especially in, in the battle scene. I saw that the uh, music was done by Fred Steiner, who composed music for the original series. And so that was really interesting that um, he brought in that kind of flair in from the original series. Combatants. In the fight, when the little spiky boxing glove goes flying off <laughs> into the guy's chest, and then he goes, and then he just keels over into the arms of the guy next to him. Yeah. Like, why don't they have some sort of, you know, partition or something? I mean, it's like it's like at a hockey game. You don't want to get a puck to the face, so you sit <laughs> by the glass or whatever. You're really risking your life by taking a front row seat to this thing. I regret nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the exact same thing. That was the two positive takeaways I have from this episode. Was that matte painting? Which I don't think they ever reused because they reuse a lot of them. And he got, yeah, the music. The music had original series feel, which you know I always like. I always like the the recurring themes that they had in the original series, and it, it felt like it, it it was a throwback to that kind of those those soundtracks. It's <laughs> everything else is, is pretty forgettable, or or you, you want to forget it. Why that razor, my friend? 
Why not the one I adjusted to perfect efficiency? Shaving is a human art form, Data. There was that random shaving scene in the middle of the episode. That actually was my favorite scene in the show, in the episode, was that joke. Two friends, you know, chatting with each other and Data making an awkward joke and Jordy explaining to, to him why it wasn't funny. And then it's like a, a great little little scene. Okay, so if we're talking about positives, that, that was a positive. Another positive was I liked in the, um, the jungle gym fighting set, the, the LED strip lighting on everything. With yeah. Tron. Can you think of one positive, Lola? That I never have to watch this again. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is weird. I like that how I like that she owns her own land, and that at the end of the episode, she got to choose who her like number one man was. Arena, no, Arena, be my first one. All my land and all my goods, all I have is yours. To rule. It is a little bit progressive in that way, right? Like, like she had all the power, and their society basically revolved around women, and that they were the the holders of land and power, and basically drove their society. I, I realize that the resolution of the episode is basically kind of like a Mission Impossible trope, where they do kind of like a switcheroo, tricky thing, where she dies but she didn't actually die, and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I still, I still keep thinking about their the, the prime directive and how everything that they're doing is kind of flying in the face of that. If a show can't maintain its own internal logic, you yeah. know, right off the bat, then it, it has some problems. So let's let's do our our ratings. So let's start with Alan. What is your rating out of five starships, Alan? I would have to give it one one out of five starships because it's. It's the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> There's, again, not a whole lot of redeeming stuff here. A couple odd scenes, a couple cool effects, music, and that's it. I agree with everything that Alan just said. One one starship. One. One star. Only one. That's, <laughs> that's generous. <laughs> that's, that's generous. That's right. I'm also going to give it one starship, um, and it's for Yarina's hashtag girl boss moment. I also give it a, a one starship, but it's a one starship at a ten. <laughs> it's a point five. It's a point five. It's a point five. <laughs> Half a starship. It's a saucer section of the. <laughs> it's a saucer section. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. See you next week. Make sure to like and subscribe, and leave a comment if you want. Oh, we haven't been doing that.